episode 2 of wise and wild podcast here welcome back welcome back ladies welcome and gentlemen welcome back um you guys must have seen episode 1 by now cuz we're awesome so i'm i'm hoping so or this could be your first episode that you could watch it after this yeah. <laughs> or you could go back you're like holy shit these guys know what they're talking about and you okay. go back after these guys are so amazing i know this is really the best podcast in the world how i mean that that's what i would do right yeah that's what i would do too <laughs> if i if i if i found my podcast there's i think that there's one or two things happening either they listen to this introduction second podcast they're like these guys don't know what they're talking about or they're full of shit or they're like okay well let's see what these guys are talking mm-hmm. about there's only and, and one then- <laughs> only one thing happening that is they're watching this they're like where wow. have i been all my life that's true that's right mm. okay <laughs> all right okay well if this is our first podcast uh, i am abby singh and i have my co-host prabdeep singh here with me and uh what this podcast about real quick is just a lifestyle entrepreneurship uh, personal development type podcast some fitness stuff as well and uh we're, we'll kind of just see where the direction for the podcast goes um but for the first few episodes we're just uh we're just talking about uh some of the stuff that prab and I both are passionate about which is uh, a <laughs> lot of like self per- success development personal development books yep um and a lot of these books revolve around the same theme you'll see as we get through the through the episodes and then eventually we'll start bringing in some guests that play the personas uh and live the lifestyle that we're reading in this book and and hopefully we'll be able to extract some uh, inspiration from them and that's true yeah so the book we're talking about today it's called uh, is it called interview with the devil or, or un- unwitting the devil outwitting the devil outwitting the devil yes yeah. right by napoleon hill napoleon hill yeah napoleon hill is a great author yeah he's uh he's one of the oldest uh I would say self help book type I I I I don't like the stigma around the word self help but like personal development book type type or authors um I know he uh I think well, he was born he was like, the first one to have organized the ph- the philosophy of success or achievement right that's just put it like that uh before him people weren't really talking as much about uh uh how to live to be achieving in life before him it was mostly just like a religion it was a religion thing and i think it was very ambiguous it was very generalized like do good deeds cuz think good things are going to happen right you got to and it was like you got to grind to get success which makes sense to a certain degree so but work hard basically is what they kept saying work hard and you'll get what you you know whatever you want basically yeah. but uh, i think he was the first one to like give it more of a like a definition and a structure to specify it. exactly what you need to do in order to attain what you whatever you want to attain right yeah and i guess what will we'll start with so i i listened to the audiobook uh again a few days ago and i listened to it the first time uh the 3 3 or 4 years ago but I, i believe the version that you listened to the first time that had a little bit of an introduction about who napoleon hill was and yeah. what kind of mindset he was when he wrote this book so yeah. maybe we can just start from there and kind of just cuz cuz like that is that's a that's a pretty amazing part of the book for me as well cuz this book he wrote he wrote it in 1938 and it was published in 2011 i believe and the reason being it was just uh it was just too controversial for a time for its time because it's obviously uh, outwitting the devil and it would it, the in the book of like he just pretends to be doing an interview with the devil which he i know which he calls it something else which which we'll dive into in a little bit but uh, for i think for the time it was just a too it was too controversial and what's what amazes me it's 2011 i can't do math right now but even so, so many years later from 1938 how applicable it is so yeah. <clears throat> like the structure that he found like you were saying earlier he 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 like brought science and structure to success is still applicable so so that that itself is kind of proven that hey like he was actually onto something you know yeah the way he uh wrote about success and wrote about attainment in general so uh, if well a little bit of a back story uh, napoleon hill he was given a task by andrew carnegie according to the books written by him he was assigned by andrew carnegie to put together a philosophy of success and he had been studying people that have you know reached high status in life and basically the top tier people back in the day he went right. went to them and he interviewed them to figure out what was it about them that made them uh as successful as they were uh <clears throat> that those interviews they weren't just interviews in the sense like you know you're sitting down and asking basic questions he had a specific aim in mind which was to put together the philosophy of success to put together a philosophy that anyone can learn 
and then apply it to their own lives and attain whatever it is that they want to attain. So that was the idea. Right. <clears throat> he was, yeah, like he was, he was bringing some structure and, and some practicality with real life examples on how they can be applied. Like, right? Yeah, so. using real people that had actually attained and a Andrew, noteworthy success. And uh, Andrew Carnegie at that time, was he one of the, was he? He was the richest. The richest in the, the richest world. richest man in America. I don't know about the world, but in America for okay. sure. Right. So he might have been in the world too. Well, the, the, see, the backstory with Andrew Carnegie is so crazy. Like I was, uh, I, I find it so amazing that he, his life goal was to spend half of his life making money, and then spend the rest of his half, the rest of the half of his life spending all the, or giving it all away, mm-hmm. or ph- philanthropy is that what's called? Yeah, yeah. So just giving it all away to the needy. Was so, he was he able to? do that i just i haven't tried. yeah he was, was he, yeah he did he didn't he didn't pass away with a lot to his name okay. so he basically gave it all away right. which is amazing which, which is, is why he wanted to give this to people too so this is the this is this is what's great about successful people they they're always so giving and they're they're able to give so much right and <clears throat> that's the they see that the whole concept of giving is just amazing because they don't even think about how much they end up who is that hold on just one sec we'll take a quick break here oh my Please. god we had a we had a guest over. He's actually here, Pradeep Pradeep Hundal in the house. We got an audience now, is what we have. <laughs> we got a live spectator. Is it hey. technically our first viewer because we haven't posted anything yet? <laughs> <laughs> live live first live one for sure. First live one for sure. Okay, where were we? I think you were talking about. Uh, so yeah, we we're talking about Andrew Carnegie. Oh, how giving from uh, from perspective of successful people, right? Yeah, so a lot of people have attained a lot. They've the biggest thing that they come with is the, the a giving hand, and the amount that they end up giving to people is just you know like everything we basically have, even sitting here in this house, every single thing we touch, we feel, we can we're sitting on this couch. Right. It was developed, made, thought up by someone, and yeah. they would give this to us. Yeah, and I think one thing uh, that was that kind of stood out to me when I was uh, listening to the audio book, uh, Napoleon Hill talks about. Uh, Back, now this is back in 1938s where people were thinking you know what the rich and the wealthy mm-hmm. got their wealth from um, like it was it, it, like they're, they're crook they're crooked people right yeah like they they had they had to do a lot of wrongs they had to cross cross a lot of people to get their wealth this but even yeah. even at that point in 1938 yeah he realized that actually these successful people they are, weren't twisted they weren't twisted in, in fact they are the non-drifters as we will get into the the book right so the book yeah. talks about how 98% of people are drifters, they're 2% non-drifters. And you need to be a non-drifter and a giving person to gain these materialistic things, right? That's true. Not just materialistic so, thing, even a sense of like yeah, a peace exactly. of mind, anything basically. Right. Uh, yeah, you were talking about uh, the whole thing of back then when they were they didn't have this philosophy in place. Most people assumed that the only way to attain anything was to uh, basically hustle someone else yep. or steal. Mm-hmm. Or raw people, raw banks, because this this was the only thing that was available for people. People didn't really understand that people they they would justify. I guess they would also justify like, oh, okay, if I do this thing, there's a risk of going to jail, but is the risk worth the reward of like getting all this money all of a sudden? Right. Yeah. And and I think the crazy thing is the time the book was written. So obviously Napoleon, he Napoleon Hill, he lived through the First World War. He lived, and this was the the Great Financial Depression in 1929, mm-hmm. and he wrote this book right after that. So the predominant thought or or the fear, pretty much worldwide, was a scarcity, right? Yes. So so that this concept that uh, and and I think I think there's still a lot of people that are living in scarcity, but this concept that there's plenty of abundance in this world. Yeah. This is fairly new. Yeah. But just just to think of that, he had the mental capability or like just just the awareness at that point 1938 that hey like actually there's there's abundance there's abundance for everyone there's no scarcity right and that that's how that's how a lot of wealthy people think yeah so i think i think that was that was that was quite interesting to me that jumped out for sure okay so the book was written and this one was written right after all the other books he had written which were like uh think or grow rich yeah uh, success through a positive mental attitude. And before that, he had written 16 Laws of Success. Right. So he'd been trying to publish. So Think and Grow Rich is the one that stands out the most because that is the one book by Napoleon Hill that everyone knows about because right. it sold the most copies. Mm-hmm. And he says himself, the reason he was so successful with Think and Grow Rich was because he applied the principles in Think and Grow Rich to make it successful, which is crazy. 
Oh, and this book, nuts, yeah. this book, he this wasn't something he was even planning to publish during his lifetime because he realized that talking with the quote unquote devil is uh, going to be frowned up upon by a lot of uh, religious people because right. you're using the term devil and you're mm-hmm. using the devil's opposition and stuff like that. So that's why he sort of like uh, just you know he he wrote the book. He had the manuscript, or his wife had the manuscript, and she got it published after he passed away. And I think that that that's an interesting aspect as well, because back then, like obviously now in 1938, you didn't you didn't really have a lot of like uh, atheist people, right? Non-believers, like yes, everyone safe have heaven was was the God, right? Whether they were Christian, Muslim, or what have you, right? They were like they were like okay, at the end of the day, I need to answer to God, so he had to be like just as to have the vision where he he would even like think of uh, having this in- metaphorical interview with the devil and ask him all these questions and then have the courage to publish it is 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 pretty unreal during that time obviously it didn't it wasn't published published because he faced a lot of controversy and I'm, I'm sure he tried his best and it was published in 20 uh 2011 but just the way he metaphorically um had that interview with the devil during those times even though he was fully aware of the criticism he would face so that that i, I can't i can't begin uh, begin to imagine what kind of courage it took back then right yeah so you haven't uh, read the introduction part of i the, haven't no the, so the in the intro that's where he talks about uh uh why this book is called outwitting the devil so he says that he this was this could have been a dream a hallucination or this could have been a reality we don't know Right. This could have actually been devil that came down and talked to him. We don't know. That's I'm just saying that. I was he I, was he in a? That's interesting. Like I'm not. I'm just curious because I haven't read this. Was he in some sort of a lucid state when he wrote this? I we don't, see. That's the thing. He he says he doesn't know himself. Oh wow. So it's up to the the listener or the reader to interpret it and be like, okay, well, would it be real? Would it be, uh, you know, like just a hallucination or is it, like is this even real? Mm-hmm. And, <clears throat> This is how I look at it. I think what happened was because he had spent so much of his life putting together the philosophy of success, he'd spent all these years. His brain is like, it's so deeply uh, seasoned in the whole philosophy of success and the, right. the ideas that even the thoughts that he has to himself, sometimes they're, they're probably giving him better ideas or more ways of putting it, like better ways of putting that, this philosophy into word. And this is what he was doing basically his whole life. He was figuring out different ways of putting the same philosophy into words. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It was like, uh, like oh yeah, if you're researching a subject over 10, 20 years, that becomes an obsession in a healthy way, obviously. Yeah. And then like the universe and like your subconscious mind is feeding you a lot of ideas that you don't really realize when you're like when you think you're fully awake so you you tap into tap into this potential and maybe he was in some sort of a lucid state or maybe he was get, getting these ideas when he was just doing you know how when we like when we have the shower ideas it's the, yeah. the one of some of our best thoughts it's just because we're like our our busy mind is thinking of something else but then we just and we're just not doing anything we're not looking at a phone something just comes to us it's like oh wow where did that come from? Yeah. But we always had that thought. We just had to reach out and extract it. So especially if someone's been focusing in on something like that for like 10, 20 years. So I think it just naturally comes to you, right? I think that that's basically what the law of attraction is. Or I think what they call it, uh, what do they call it here? Synchronized, uh, uh, I'm blanking here. What, what was it called in the book? Which one? The uh, the infinite intelligence? No, like the, the what, 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 what was the law? Harmony? Of the, well, the law of the nature. It was It was something to do with Free frequency or synchronization. Anyways, we'll we'll get to it in a minute. Okay, so uh, oh, uh, hyp- hypnotic rhythm. Hypnotic, hypnotic rhythm. rhythm. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, I remember that one. Yeah. Uh, th- see, some people call it the secret. Some people call it the law of attraction. I think it's the same thing. It's all the same thing. It's just hundred percent the same thing. Yeah. Like if you if you actually have read the book The Secret by Rhonda Byrne, she actually got uh, inspired by Napoleon Hill, Bob Proctor, a lot of these guys, mm-hmm. like from the nineties. And all like, it's essentially, because that book is a thin, right? It's, it's essentially a summary of all these learnings. And she, she noticed this, this theme, like all these success books always come down to this, uh, almost seems like a metaphysical uh, law of the universe, which is the law of attraction. She, she called it, uh, Napoleon Hill called it the hypnotic rhythm. And, and what's, and actually, you know what? I, I brought it up in the last podcast. We're going to make a podcast on this eventually too, uh, an episode on how, in modern day science right now yeah how quantum physics is starting to prove that 
your mind actually interferes with your reality and shapes your reality but that's that's a, it, <laughs> that's it, a separate podcast that's separate, but that's like for me the way my brain operates as soon as i started to look into that stuff i was like wow man holy shit you know what i mean that was that was the epiphany i was like wow this is this is unreal okay so from a epiphany epiphany is that the word epiphany. i think so yeah okay epiphany. from i just remembered uh, <laughs> so you know how i just had the little episode like when i uh, after the gym right yeah uh day before yesterday yeah the day before yesterday mm -hmm. where uh like i was a little bit lost it was like a state where i'm half asleep and half awake but i couldn't make sense of a lot of things right. i couldn't make sense of words right so uh i was holding I, i was holding my phone and i was looking at it and i was looking at this this text that i wanted to type right. i even typed a text but the text was completely different from what i was thinking that i was going to type so th this has never happened to me before but now i look back at it and i see that text and i'm like when i typed it i was 100% sure that that was me i had no doubt in my mind that i typed that text like i typed this thing but why is this text not what i remember so i guess just before you dive into too much detail let's just give the audience a little bit of context so they know what you're talking about so yeah. the episode you're talking about you had i'll i'll let you explain i i like i i don't even know what to call it some are saying it was like a minor stroke yeah like maybe like a blood clot traveled up to my brain and like you know it kind of like mm -hmm. shut off some of the functions up there yeah. i don't know how it works yeah. but uh but the doctor you, said that it was a minor stroke right but yeah, you were like you you were not fully there. control of your in, i don't I, you, i couldn't access everything in my brain basically you can comprehend like like even when like the nurse kept asking you or you asked the nurse 10 times like oh why is my blood pressure so high and she like started freaking out was like like kept, is no, he is he always like this i i kept forgetting Yeah, yeah. So basically what I'm trying to get to is that our brain is so powerful and so well balanced that we don't even realize all that goes on just to keep us sane and functioning on a daily yeah. basis. Cuz I know this was a, like a very very minor thing. I know it could have happened because I lifted hard that day. Mm -hmm. I could have been it could have been the pre-workout. It could have been uh just stress in general. It could have been anything. We don't know what it was, mm -hmm. but it was this minor imbalance in the brain and it caused such a big delusion. and from then from that it tells you how powerful the brain is and it gives you an appreciation for it for sure it gives you an appreciate firstly and secondly how powerful it is yeah. because it we don't know what really goes on we don't know what's really going on right. all we know is what we can comprehend as human beings right. do we really know what reality is or do, are we just comprehending what our five senses give us hmm if you really think about I it see, i see i see where you're going with this but yeah yeah So, I know what you mean, yeah. And sometimes, like yeah, that day when some of those avenues were closed for me, and I was so confused as to, okay, where am I? Like, what's going on? Why is everything so confusing? Why don't things make sense? Right. Why can't I write this word that I'm trying to write? So that that, that kind of tells you that our brain is working so hard to just keep us on this uh, reality, quote unquote. that it's it's serving us we don't know what actually is going on right. so that's why i think the subconscious mind and like the law of attraction we don't really i don't think we even understand what is actually going on the reality is what the brain is serving us yep. in the most appropriate way for all of us because we've already we all of us have come to an agreement that this is reality and that's what bra our brain has been giving us 100%, 100% and and that's why i think uh, like quantum physics is just starting to scratch the surface of it right now but it can go so much deeper and like it could put it in it could you could just hit a wall and then you break the wall and then there's like 10 more walls and then once you you know once you go through it like it just branches off and there's there's like a whole new field of study that we didn't even know existed but that's, i think that's why they say that you can never go to quantum physics to find answers because every answer is just more questions because 100%, 100%. it doesn't make any sense <laughs> yeah, yeah. because in because we what we understand is the the logical world the 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 atoms and like this and that like what we you know there's there's limits and walls to it yeah. and but even in this book he talks about how there is no limits to to the to the reality of the in, infinite intelligence right. there's no limits napoleon talk, talks about it himself mm -hmm. so th that was back then Yeah. Like he figured that out back yeah. then and now we're starting to see that like holy, we don't even know yeah. if there's actually like these limits even exist because like a, for example a, a, qu a quantum computer it's a bit when you look at it it becomes something else but it is something else when you don't observe it which doesn't make yeah. any sense just by the mere f act of looking at it changes it mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense why why would it change like that mm -hmm. so just like that uh there's obviously studies of like when you have when you're thinking about stuff and the kind of impact it has on 
like water droplets they do these like experiments on how water droplets dry like they, they like dry them mm -hmm. and they, and they like uh they have different sort of like thought experiments like if what kind of thought energy changes like even a water droplet and even that becomes different we don't know how it's negatively positively impacting it yeah. but we do know that it has a difference the things that we can't see we can't uh put a finger on we can't even explain with science but things that are making a difference from a quantum field for example that's yeah. what we're talking about 100 percent, 100 percent. there's uh yeah there's plenty of experiments right now which uh, they're trying to figure out how to happen so like it's taken it back very high level. Let's say if there's six outcomes to an experiment, yeah. you know, like those are the six, only six probabilistic outcomes. Depending on what the observer's anticipation is of the outcome, that outcome changes. That Yes, exactly. That's unreal, right? That like, is crazy. So, so like, yeah, just, just to put that in perspective. But yeah, like I said, I think <laughs> we're, we're kind of digressing here a little bit going down that loophole. But yeah, we should definitely, we should definitely make an episode just particularly on that. So yeah, we're not obviously well read on this. These, yeah. whatever I'm saying, these are just things or small articles, small videos that I watch here and there. They're, or they're just like little uh, examples that they've been given in like books. Right. But what I'm trying to talk about is that, because uh, obviously Napoleon, he's, his uh, philosophy is based a lot in uh, the subconscious and the infinite intelligence or the thing, the word they used earlier, what was it? Uh, hypnotic rhythm. Hip, the hypnotic rhythm. Which, like, is, which is law of attraction, essentially. So we, so we, that's why I was kind of going into this, this avenue of yeah. like, what he says, it does, it's starting to come up a lot with obviously the quantum physics now and the, we're starting to see that stuff now. Mm -hmm. um, but we digress again. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think it's, it's important. I think, I think it, it all tie, ties back to really what we want to talk about. So, so yeah, I know you were going through uh, essentially what you read in that first hour of bonus material introduction. So yeah, like you, you were saying, uh, he was doing the success research, research for Andrew Carnegie. Yeah. And then he wasn't, uh, or he doesn't remember from the book. He says it's up to the reader for interpretation on if he actually had the conversation with the devil or if it was, he was, it was a talk with his subconscious mind or if it was just a metaphorical talk. And I, I kind of like how he left it open-ended because I think, honestly, this, this is a sidebar here, I think that's an incredibly genius marketing tactic to engage all audiences. If you're a religious person, you, you could, you could, you could uh, resonate with, oh, maybe, you know what, actually, I want to believe he actually had the conversation with the devil. Yeah. If you're a scientific person, he's like, yeah, I know he was just talking, talking to his subconscious. But if you think about how broad of a range of uh, uh, customer base that covers, that, that's pretty genius back then. Too. <laughs> customer base. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, I don't just, know. That, feel, that word just feels dirty in this context. Eh? <laughs> I, I know what you mean. <laughs> he's like, we're talking about success. And he's like, oh, how many, how many copies can I sell again? <laughs> no, that's the thing. Like, with, See, with these books, these aren't as popular as like Think and Grow Rich. And he talks about himself that like the, the title itself, Think can grow rich the reason that book is so popular having had the same philosophy same ideas why is think and grow rich so much more popular yep. because of the title because he knew how to target people that like okay so i've been thinking about this thing too like when you think about outwitting the devil you have to think that okay well it's an interview that he had with the devil and he had to pick out and like understand these ideas and actually like think about them or when you say things like success through a positive mental attitude well you can kind of like or, you know, wave that off by like, oh, well, like having success through a positive mental attitude, that positive mental attitude is nothing. Like that's, that's BS. There's no point talking about it. But when you t talk about uh, think and grow rich, people are like, oh, well, all I have to do to get rich is think. Yeah, yeah. Or again, like, again, marketing. Like think about the marketing that name had to it back in 1930s. Obviously now in 2022, you... It's a genius title. It's, it's genius. It's yeah, genius. That, yeah. And that's what he says in the book too, that this came from his subconscious and he left it to his subconscious for that idea to just flow through him. And that's right. what led him to like, he did make a lot of money off of these books too, which is what he was also trying to do more as well as trying to like build this philosophy. Yeah. But I think, and I, I think, I think again back then, and I think even, even to some extent now, uh, there's a stigma around making money that, right? Like we're, we're talking about that. The way I said it, I guess, doesn't sound right. No, no, I know. I know. I, I think, I, I think you said it perfectly because he clarified in the book that like, you need to be a, a non-drifter. You need to, you need to be, I guess, metaphorically, he said he just had to be out of the grasp of the devil, which is the devil is in, in your head, essentially, to achieve materialistic success, a philosophical success, and then also just like, you know, just be, being a happy individual overall. So I think I think everything ties like that. That's like just the he's saying the hypnotic rhythm of law of attraction is the 
law that governs the universe, right? That governs the na- governs everything. So that and that that's where he essentially everything fed down to his book. <laughs> I I, can't, I don't kind of you lost me there for a minute. <laughs> I guess no. Fair, fair enough. I was as I was saying it too. I was like, I think I'm jumping around a little bit. But, <laughs> what, I, okay, but what I but what I, what I'm trying to say is that him making money off that publication, yeah, is perfectly fine. Of course, he he like back then it would have been hard to fathom. Like, oh, you're you know you're making all these claims and you're trying to help the world. Why the fuck are you making money off it? Yes, but like it's perfectly fine. And that and think that that that's that's something people need to understand, right? You make what what's wrong with making money? If you're helping someone, if I'm giving you a service mm-hmm. and you're paying me for it, what's wrong with that? Mm-hmm. That's the whole that is that is actually how money should be made. Yeah. Money should be made through providing good service for us to be sitting here having all these resources that we do. We have all this because we paid for the resource and we're grateful that we ha- we're able to just pay for it and then get the things that we want. Right. What if we what if we just like anything we're paying for, we're always just like, okay, well, you're making money off of me, so I'm not going to pay you this. How are they going to develop the technologies to give us the things that we need? Yeah. Like you, like if anything, that gives you the tools to give. Like if, if, if like philanthropy, right? And this too, he has in the book. In I don't know if it's in this. I, this is in this one. Uh, he talks about how uh, duty. No, not that one. The other one where he talks about how to to say that you want to make a cup of coffee in the morning. First, you would need the cup itself. So you would need to go to someone like a, like a like a clay maker who make the cups. Yeah, yeah. And then you need to go to like the person who makes the coffee. So you need to go to like a coffee farm. And then you need to go get the milk. So you need to go to the milk farm. Then you need to go get the sugar. So all the stuff that you need just to make coffee, there's so much. So if, if like capitalization or like, uh, like just the, in general globalization and people providing us those, those products and services to our homes didn't exist, we would, we would not have this uh, modern life that we live. 100%. Yeah. So, so j- just like that, a philosophy or a book is also ideas that we should be grateful that this person like, came out with and we're able to use them mm-hmm. for our own benefit. And f- if we have to pay him for like 20 bucks for a book, who cares? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a priceless uh, uh, philosophy. Yeah, 100%. And I think, and like, again, with, with him, him being what he does, uh, I think... Uh, it's essentially what it, what it boils down to is like you need these resources and you need to be fulfilled yourself first yeah to actually help people and i think he he talks about it we'll we'll dive into it here in a minute he says which was interesting to note and back then it was a controversial idea it's like what about the devil uh sorry napoleon asks what about my duties to my 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 parents yeah my friends my relatives what about them like i i'm i'm supposed to make sacrifices to make them happy and devil's like that's one of the biggest traps that people fall into your biggest you don't have a duty to anyone you have a duty to yourself yeah like you need to make sure you're fulfilled first and then it's going to show out in all your relationships right you know yes. what i mean that was that, that was and that's a controversial opinion back then like because like, it, it, it's like back then the predominant uh thought that everyone had was it you know you know what like you need to you need to make sacrifices for to make everyone else happy around you yeah. Even, even even though you're miserable right yeah but then he he says to actually live a fulfilled life your first duty is to yourself you have to be willing to receive is that what you're trying to say like when you you're giving so much to the world you can't just say oh i'm only going to give you also have to be willing to receive i, I guess so you I'm, can give more going down the road i guess what i'm maybe a step back from there or what i'm trying to say is you need to be full to give you need to be full to give like you need to be full like you the, the biggest duty you have uh, is to yourself first you know what i mean so i think uh essentially what he's saying is like oh actually well, i made one of the notes here if you see D- duty is misunderstood duty is one of the duty to oneself is the greatest duty and only after that duty to others may be exercised right so oh, okay so, okay. so you, you, you know where i'm coming from so yeah so a lot of times where he asked the devil is like why let's say for example um a kid uh let, let, let's let's say you have a kid in future right yeah uh you're going to and and a lot of parents do which 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 makes sense like you, you you're gonna have an expectation of him to since since you know like you gave him birth you gave him all these uh you, you taught you essentially you raised him up you gave him all these um like you gave him a comfortable life and everything that he should he owes a duty to you okay you know what i mean which 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 is way which is the way uh people like were thinking about it back then 
Okay. And I think I think maybe this is a concept that that we that, uh, that was kind of shocking to me initially as well. Not not when I read the book this time, but when I originally read it. What he says is, you don't have duty to anyone. Mm-hmm. Your duty is to yourself first. Yeah. Obviously, once and w- what what he means by duty, having the duty to yourself is you need to make sure that number one, um, when like when you're when you're thinking. And when you have when you have any plans and actions, if your if like your friends or your family is criticizing you and they don't think they don't think it's gonna work, if you believe in yourself and you actually think it's a solid plan, you don't listen to criticism. Number one, you don't listen to criticism from people that have not uh, like they're not in a position to criticize you. You know what I mean? For example, like you won't if like if if you're trying to go into business and Bill Gates give you advice, you will take it seriously. But if uh, if a person is just typically criticizes you just doing a nine to five job and he's trying to give you advice, even if his family, you don't you don't you don't listen to them. And then your duty is to yourself to make sure you're full fulfilled first. Like and that could be emotionally fulfilled. Um, and I think I think materialist materialistic things don't even come in this avenue because by by human nature, people uh, to, for people to bring happiness to the, to themselves, they essentially when they acquire materialistic things, they'll most of the time they want to share right? yeah because that, that that that's what gives them happiness but what what he's saying is if you're in a place of resentment yeah you cannot give so you need to you need to work your number one duty is to yourself figure out who you are okay what you want in life make sure your passions are clear okay work towards them make sure you're full and then then you're you're in a position to give okay so what you're essentially saying is that uh, you should be excited and uh, living your life to the fullest first Mm-hmm. Before you start thinking that, uh, oh, I have to make my life miserable because I'm trying to provide for all these other people. Right. And I think, yeah, yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to say. And I think there's there's extreme examples to this where, for example, let's say if someone, if there is a guy in Syria or something, let's say, right, he, he's trying to provide for his family mm-hmm. and, and that, that, that that's all he can do. Mm-hmm. At that point, like p- people would take it to the extremes and try to apply this, apply this, this, this to those situations. But at that point, what that guy's duty to himself is, he wants to keep his family happy. Yeah. So by by doing that, he's doing that duty to himself. Because because yeah. he's like you know how the the per, the hierarchy of uh, needs is. Yeah. I don't I don't remember exactly what it is. He's he's at the bottom Security of the pyramid. And, uh, he's at the bottom of the pyramid. Yeah. So his duty itself is like. What fulfills him is that his kids are fed and his wife is properly taken care of. Yeah. So that's his duty. Now, what what he's referring to, obviously, in, in the North American society, is most of the people are in the first, uh, the, the 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 second or the top top layer of the pyramid. At that point, you need to make sure that you you fulfill a duty to yourself first, and that's the only way to do it. And then, and then you have the duty to others, right? Well, I, I guess what you uh, in general, if you're in survival mode and you're just not even safe then I don't think you even have time to think about or you won't even think about uh, attaining things because you just don't feel safe. Yeah, because then you're at the bottom of that. And, and, and that then what you want for yourself changes as well. Like yeah. you, what you want is to provide for your family. No, you want to be safe, I guess, first. Yeah, yeah. like are you talking about at the bottom of the... Uh... Yeah, like say you're at the bottom of the pyramid and you don't have security right. or any sort of safety and you feel uh, you know, just fearful. Mm-hmm. You're in the middle of war, and you know you're just scared for your life. You're scared for your yeah, kids. Yeah, at, at that point, you just want to make sure you're safe, your family's safe, right? Yeah. So, but so that's where uh, well, he does talk about a f- about fear a lot. In that scenario, where it's literally like you're literally unsafe, your it's body like is life in, and death situation. Yeah, the, in that case, yes, obviously fear is acceptable because you need fear to get out of that and get into like a more safer spot. But uh, like. It, like this is this is going off topic a bit here, but he talks about fear a lot too in the book. Right. Uh, he talks about how fear is, is is used mostly in places where there's no need for fear to exist in life in general with people, because people are fearful of uh, things that should never make them fearful, such as like uh, in- simple anxieties, uh, like in today's society, bills scare people. Yeah. Like, but the fear that they feel is to the same extent of like, oh, I'm, f- I'm fearful of this tiger that's chasing me. Yeah. It's th- and I think, I think uh, we like both of us, I know we, we were both at one point and still sometimes do str- struggle with that thing, right? Like yeah. uh, money has always been in a lot of people's uh, lives, especially as they're growing up and they're just 
Just figuring things out. Figuring things out and stuff is like, oh, this, you see the bills, like, how am I going to, at one point in life, I think a lot of people, if unless you're blessed, like you go through is like, how am I going to make, make end, ends meet, right? Yeah. But uh, when you look back at it in, in hindsight, yeah, the stress that you were living at in, in, that, in that particular time, because there's no point stressing out about it, right? So that, that that's, I guess that's the fear that you need to uh, take charge of. Yeah, so uh, well, I, I don't know if we have this like listed here, but one of the what he talks about fear in the book is that fear is a devil's tool. Yes, hundred percent. The de- a fear, any sort of a fear, being fearful of anything and working or uh, living from a place of fear is basically you serving the devil and bringing the worst kind of a life to yourself. And as soon as soon as you feel fearful and you feel like, oh, I have to do this thing because you have a fear thought, that means that, uh, like I said, I've said this before too, most of the jobs that I've done, obviously I'm still growing up, still learning. Most of the jobs that I've done have come from a place of fear because I'm just fearful of not being able to pay for the things that need to be paid for. I'm fearful of not being homeless. Mm-hmm. I'm fe- like I'm not doing the things that I'm doing because I have excitement towards them or I haven't been. The things are changing now, but haven't been things that I have excitement for things that I am uh, constructively on a path or I'm on to working towards a worthy ideal or on my uh, major purpose, as he right. says it. If I'm, if I'm not on my major purpose and I'm just doing things to make ends meet, that's living in fear. That's right. living from fear. Right. And uh, I guess not necessarily. A lot of people just don't give it that much thought. A lot of times people are just like, you know, they're just go- going by it day by day. But in my case, it's been, you yeah. know, because I don't want to work and I don't go to work most of the time. But uh, when I do, it comes from a place of fear. And having been working from a place of fear, it has brought a lot, obviously like a lot of like, uh, stress, anxiety, and a lot of health issues as well that I believe that mm-hmm. came upon me because I was fearful, fearful of the things that I was doing or fearful and doing things that I, because I was fearful. Mm-hmm. And that leads to uh, uh, ill health, like he talks about in there too. And when right. you're fearful and now you have ill health, now you have like multiple layers, you know, piling on each other. Yeah. So, but as soon as you f- choose to let go of the fear and you do the same thing, but do it from perspective of, Oh, I'm not fearful anymore. Now I'm doing this because I have a purpose or a goal. And this is what's going to help me attain my purpose. Let's just say you're a cashier working at a, as a cashier. That's the only job you have. Mm-hmm. You go to work every day and you're going there and you, uh, you're getting whatever you're getting paid, but you hate that job. But now you've decided that you make uh, $100 a day. Out of those $100 a day, you're going to save 50 per day for a month and get this thing to start your business. Right. Now you've built yourself a path, a purpose. Now you're not going to work because you're fearful that you won't be able to pay for rent or you will you be able to pay for rent now, but you're, because now you're on a major uh, on a path of a major purpose or like walk, going through life with the purpose, you've already uh, become less fearful, more excited, added enthusiasm to your life. Mm-hmm. And that's what he talks a lot about in the book yeah. of having a major purpose and not living with fear, living with excitement and enthusiasm and looking forward to the things that you're planning to do. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I think, uh, and I, I like how he explains that why it's it's not a like preferable outcome to chase it, but it's a necessity for people to chase it. People need to realize it because... What do you mean by that? So, mean? So, so let me elaborate here. So when you were explaining, you know, how you were like when you were operating from fear... Yeah. Um, by the time you were done work or even when you were working, you had like health issues. You were stressed out. Even 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 though you were making money and you were trying to make ends meet, uh, you were drained out of energy. Yeah. But now, let's say if you're working on a YouTube channel or for podcasting or if you're doing something you love, you could be working 16 hours a day. And on the 17th hour, you're still glooming with energy, right? Yes. You have a conversation and you just have so much life force that goes through it. It provides you fulfillment. Yes. So so he so he almost describes it. It's almost a sin to live in fear. You know, you're not you're not doing yourself like you're not living your life to the fullest. And yeah. and, and life is short. And obviously, we understand. And he kind of goes through it in the book that uh, it's hard to break that cycle. Yeah. But it's it's uh, every individual. It's not it's not like preferred to break the cycle. It's a necessity. They should break the cycle. Some feedback there, right? Hold on one sec. It's Pradeep, I think. Yeah. It's yeah. okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. Yeah. Where are we? Fear. 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 
<laughs> I want I want to induce some fear on Pradeep right now. To be honest with you, I want him to be fearful of me. <laughs> Anyways. Oh my god. <laughs> um but yeah. So I think uh I think that, that I think that's a good overview. We could we could probably dive into some uh, some specific detail. Well actually just maybe one last uh digress here. So you know how like we were talking about earlier about um uh, like one's duty to themselves mm-hmm. first and then it's actually like you need to pr- make sure that you are fulfilled in order to give like even financially and everything, right? Elon Musk uh, made a tweet a couple of days or it was uh, during an interview. He said, like, once you get and you got to think about this one a little bit. But once you attain wealth and the billions, yeah. right, you have no you have no shortage of money in terms of like spending it on materialistic things. Yeah. It, all it becomes, it becomes about capital allocation at that point. Yeah. So he what he was trying to say is like why don't like think about this concept and he was just putting it out there because he, he knew it would be a controversial tweet but like all these all these people like jeff bezos uh bill gates elon musk that are, are supposedly billionaires. so billionaires supposedly and trying to do like great things for the world yeah why do they pay these crazy taxes now again this t- these billions of dollars are capital allocation because that's how huge sum of money is it is right to the to the government to which has proven to be a failed organization for doing th- this, these sorts of capital allocation yeah. versus keeping it to themselves. Like they, he's almost saying, may I argue argument how billionaires should be exempt fr- from taxes yeah. so he can do better allocation of that capital that he would have rather paid in taxes with the innovative team that he has. I see. I agree with them. I but- agree with them 100% too. I'm like, wow. <clears throat> but a lot of like, obviously the doubt, it's controversial in the sense where if a person's like a socialist and if he reads it as like, yeah, tax evasion. He's just trying to get out of taxes. Yeah. But if you actually think about what he's saying, like if if you're paying the government thirty billion dollars, yeah, that's not that's not token money. That like that's capital allocation type money. Like they can build hydro dams with that, right? Yeah. But will they? You don't know. Like what what will they use it for? And they've been obviously there's plus. I'm uh, not to get in politics, but like the government has been over time proven to not be the best allocator of capital. They're so, not very efficient with They're money. not very efficient with money. And like here you have Elon Musk and people like these that have all these innovative teams and are visionaries. Wouldn't that money be better in, in their hands for allocation? They probably do greater, greater good to the society. I guess they would. But then we need an organization mm-hmm. that uh, does like uh, an organization that does things for the public that uses the tax money and then does things for the public. Yeah. But there's no such organization other than the government itself. So... It's either like the is Elon Musk himself going to like make sure that he does something with the thirty billion that he's gonna pay in taxes mm-hmm. for the public, or is he gonna just keep that money for himself and spend maybe ten out of it and then be yeah. like, oh, I spent it all. And I think yeah, and I think I think that's what the fundamental problem there is. Um, that um, like he obviously he's just as a surface is posing a question and provoking people to think about it. But if you think about it, um, yeah, like. If you were to practically do it, you would create like an NGO type organization with like obviously people you trust. Now any any organization with billions of dollars, there's always going to be crooks, right? That's what I'm trying there's, to say. There's always going to be crooks, or <laughs> like <laughs> there's no way to go around it because it's it's either you have the government or, or you or have you, or you have faith in these guys, or you have faith in the other which 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 not everyone will, right? Yes, because we don't know, we mm-hmm. we don't know, right? Like it's. I guess it's okay, like the way it is. It's not perfect. The it's system, not perfect, yeah. But it is what it is. There, there's no better system, I guess. This is a solution that people, someone should solve at some point. Someone should look at, it. yeah. yeah. For, for for billionaires, create a separate organization and see how that capital needs to be allocated. Yes, because the government is not a very wise spender of money. Hundred <laughs> percent. Because no. they, there's a lot of money that they get, but we don't know where it goes. And there's obviously like a lot of leaks in governments too, because and uh, they can always print money if it's. Uh, if their stocks are getting low. <laughs> but anyways, we're getting political here. <laughs> but, or they could use it for wars because, you know, that those are important. <laughs> those are important, yeah. <laughs> wow. But yeah, no, it's uh, not... not, not They're going to have the bigger n- bigger rocket than the other guy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, what it's, do you mean? A, it's all it's, it's pretty it's like a it's like a it's big all, it's, it's like a big 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 day contest between countries right <laughs> it's always about the rocket who yeah. has the bigger rocket you know the, the movie um 
Was it the was the Aladdin or some something like that? No, I don't know what you're talking. Was this? Oh, the Aladdin. Yeah, the the the, the, the pointy. Uh, the, no, oh, the, the dictator. The dictator. The dictator yeah, <laughs> he's like he's like the just song. yeah, just make it pointy. Just make it. And I feel like I feel like I, I won't even be surprised if like someone walks into research facility and they made like this really tiny rocket. Like you know what? That just doesn't look mighty enough. You need to make it make it bigger. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's I'm sure that's other thing. You know about the NASA one of the NASA space shuttles that they launched. One of the I don't know if you know about this, but the discovery was it? I think the discovery, the one that exploded. Right. Uh, they the scientists were telling the government they were like, "Yo, we can't, you know, we can't go yet. This is not done." The, there's like there were some O rings that were faulty, and they were telling them, and uh, like according to their research, they, it wasn't gonna make it. And but the government pressurized them so much into is this is what I've heard. It's very mm. rough, obviously. They pressured them so so much into like launching it because like they were already delaying it so much and they were apparently looking stupid to the world right. that their rocket isn't working. Yeah. Uh, that they just ended up launching it as it was and they killed five people, five astronauts. Yeah. And obviously that that's a controversial topic and like different news sources will provide different information, but I won't be surprised if that actually happens. Yeah. Not not even one bit. Yeah, because a lot of these things get covered up and they don't right. come up. Yeah. And how things really because the biggest problem with the gover the government spending money is that they there's no one who who has him themselves invested into it. These people or these politicians or not just politicians, like these people in positions of power that have the authorities, their own capital isn't invested into it and they're not, not all of them are doing those things because they actually have the best of humanity in mind. Some, a lot of these people, they just, you know, they're, it's propaganda. they're, they're functioning from a place of scarcity and they think that like, oh, like, you know, like, oh, we'll just, you know, do this thing and, take our cut and you know give this contact to this friend of ours who's a, who we have to pay three times more but it's okay because he's my friend and he's gonna give me some out of it yeah you know like that's what that's what usually goes on what can you do that's just how because they're not trying to serve they're just trying to see what they can get out of it i mean there's a there's a little bit of that and i think there is the people that are actually not crooked they just get rolled in with the propaganda right like the 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 propaganda is just so strong and i think uh napoleon hill talks about it as well like but through repetition through media sources and everything like it just it just if if you actually like, sit back and take an objective view on how the news changes anytime there's elections yeah and how certain channel channels behave and how you know how people change when there's elections and stuff like you'll realize like what kind of prop underlying propaganda they're trying to push on on or narrative they're trying to push on the public but i think like propaganda is one of the biggest i think evils he mentioned as well in in his book that uh, it takes a non-drifter to recognize and an independent independent thinker to re recognize if something is actually fact or if it just uh, if it just cap i guess <laughs> or propaganda yeah <laughs> Factor no, cap. I like that. I like the <laughs> factor cap. That's, yeah. perfect. That's true. It takes a yes. It takes a non-drifter to realize that there, most people are drifters. Mm -hmm. Most people. So what a drift? What is a drifter? What if I were to ask you, like, what's a drifter? How would you explain a drifter to the people? So I'll I'll kind I'll try to stick to Napoleon Hill's uh, definition, and then I'll, I'll probably uh, add in a little bit of what I think a modern day drifter looks like. So what Napoleon Hill says in his interview with the Devil, he's saying that ninety percent, ninety eight percent of the people are drifters. Okay. And 2% are non-drifters. So what a drifter is to like on a high level before we get into detail is a person who does not have the power of independent thought, mm -hmm. right? And it's just for lack of better words, they are just stuck in a cycle uh, of uh, their essentially that like their, their day to day lives. They don't, they don't double question anything. Like for example, propaganda, one of the things if they see something on the news, if there's something, a predominant, uh, uh, thing that me actually that's another interesting thing like he talked about media back in 1938 when it was only radio and he 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 was able to s sort out like the narrative how it was shifting between world war one and world war two because and like how hitler was controlling narrative to to feed his uh to, to, to feed his agenda but anyways um people like not, not independent think thinkers people who give in to propaganda too easily uh people who live in fear mm -hmm. uh, play operate out of a place of fear mm -hmm. Um, and I guess, uh, overall people that do not understand the law of attraction or, or hypnotic rhythm, I think he calls it, which, which is a little bit more detailed, but, uh, like people don't understand that their predominant thoughts attract to them, uh, what the materialistic 
or, or the physical equivalent of it, right? So mm-hmm. like they, since since they're living, and that's why I call it a vicious cycle. Since they're living in fear, and they're always thinking of scarcity, that's what comes up bestows upon them, right? That that's just a law of universe. That that just how how it's always going to be. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think I might have missed a few points. Please feel free to add on. No, I think the biggest thing I think that you did miss is. Uh, someone who lacks a definite major purpose yes 100 percent. yeah that, that you know what that I, that's probably top of the list yeah that is the top of the list yeah so that's someone who's a drifter who doesn't who isn't focused on a path and isn't moving about it mm-hmm. who's basically drifting through the wind like drifting a plastic bag <laughs> is that a song <laughs> it's a song okay. do you ever feel <laughs> like a plastic bag Drifting through the wind, wanting uh, to start again. Okay, that's kind of that's kind of sad. <laughs> I haven't heard this song. So that's before. like a you know like a plastic bag doesn't have any direction because the yeah. wind is just taking it all over the place. Yeah. That's what it means. Like a drifter is someone who's just drifting, who doesn't really have a path, a clear cut purpose, right. and who isn't going in one direction. Right. Are, whatever comes right. is what they start doing. Right. Do you need something? Just, just stretching. I need to like start stretching a little bit more at the gym, man. I'm, uh, I feel like my body's just so stiff. Yeah, I feel honestly. I feel like we're a little bit stiff today. Is that? Do you feel that too? No. Like I feel like we're not like as relaxed. We're just me. No, no. I think I think it's alright. Are we? Yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm just. Uh, I know my, my body body is a little, a little too stiff, but I gotta work on mobility. But no, no. Like you mean the conversation? Yeah. No, fuck no, man. Okay. Why? I don't know. I felt like it was a little bit like you know. Up t- tense and Are you operating out of fear? No, <laughs> I'm not operating. No, no I'm actually no. pretty good. Cool. I'm pretty good. No, right? I, I think it's. I think it's. I think it's good conversation. I, I like. Like, I, I'm, that's how I want to. I want to keep it. You know what I mean? Like, we shouldn't. Like, you shouldn't a, at any point in time just agree with me for the sake of agreeing with me. Yeah. And I, I won't do the same. Yeah. Because that 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 that's how like when you I, I forgot this definite purpose or you brought it up. I agree with you and like a few things where I was like, oh yeah, you know what? Actually, yeah, I was wrong. I agree with him. I think. That that's important to keep this conversation open, and you tell me, right? That's very important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, definite of purpose is basically like you know you're going a certain direction, and you know that you're going that. And uh, obviously, the the biggest reason that it makes you a non drifter is because when you are going about your path, not everything that's shiny grabs your attention, and you start looking at it. And right. Yeah. A lot of people, for example, us immigrants, were in a way even lucky. To have to be definite in our purpose because we do have to build our lives from the ground up because otherwise we're standing on the street if we don't do anything we're standing on the street we don't have anything but obviously what happens is that uh, you reach a certain level of comfort and then you become a drifter <laughs> that's what happens to like i think majority of even immigrants mm-hmm. no that's a good point and i just to add on to that he does mention in his book you know how there's a statistic if uh, if a kid's dad owns a owns a massive business empire a lot of times you can notice the kid either does not take it to the next level or either just kills it because he does not understand how to operate like he's because he's been drifting along and he, he thinks everything that he he gets it just uh like it, it's just normal he doesn't understand the necessity and, and like he doesn't have a purpose of this is what i need to do right yeah i think i think uh yeah that, he that, doesn't that, have that, a definite of purpose de- de- definitive purpose right yeah. and i think i think also in in some ways like you know how people always criticize criticize uh the, these kids was like man you had everything yeah what how come <laughs> how come you couldn't like take it to the next level or at least maintain it i would argue the other way around where they i i feel like just because they had everything they yeah. never had the opportunity to build it for themselves and that's how you learn right yeah like their parents probably had the opportunity to build it themselves and and kind of learn from necessity and like learn from their definite purpose but now everything was handed handed to him so if anything i would argue he has he has a disadvantage <laughs> you know what i mean and that that's why like when he like that kind of ties in how you say like immigrants right we know we need to do something here yeah right we need to like I need to get up on my feet. Like for me, when I first moved here in 2013, I, I I knew okay I need to graduate out of school. I need to find a good job. I need to get my permanent residency. I need to and then I was like okay obviously other things. I need I need to like work on work on what I want to work on a business or what have you and you know and like like this what we're doing right now. Like I think I think it it helps you to be driven if if you kind of if you have to like work for. A, I don't want to say work for things. That's probably not the best way to put it. I know uh, Napoleon had articulated it a lot better than I am right now. Yeah. But like, uh, 
hundred percent there's a correlation between those two things, right? Well, so first of all, obviously Napoleon Hill articulated these things a lot better, a lot than, better than we than can, we can we because we can, yeah. the, the the that's the whole point. We're not you know up to up to his level yet. I think, I think we're, we're trying. We're to, doing. We're kind of dumbing it down for ourselves <laughs> to understand that we're talking about it. Yeah. So see, we're on. Uh, uh, it, it's our definite purpose to be able to say things the way he used to be able to say them. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and we're working on that. that. Summarizes and it. we don't have to like, you know, beat ourselves up for not being there yet, just yet. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so children of wealthy men uh, rarely attain any newer levels of uh, success. Even the even any levels of success for themselves because you, they'll be obviously financially they're taken care of and most of them will be fine because you know uh, family wealth goes a long way right. but uh, it, in terms of attaining their own uh, new success in any other field it doesn't have to be money money and business is one aspect of life like good relationships uh, being a good athlete even mm-hmm. or doing good in school even like uh, maybe in school school is different but like it, majority of the fields of life you you, they're they're less likely to because they they already have everything uh, that they could desire handed to them. That mm-hmm. desire isn't burning anymore. What is the burning desire for? Mm-hmm. But again, maybe even and them, th- there's obviously exceptions to it as well. Like and and if you look at those exceptions, you could kind of see they were raised in a different way where they were taught. And we can m- maybe tie this to back to like the education system. Uh, I uh, think that Napoleon talked about on how even that back then. He was criticizing on how, like, in school, we're, we're taught facts. Yeah. And we're asked to cram facts. And what he was saying, if I were to summarize in one line, like, we should be taught how to independently think. Yes. Right? That's that, awesome. That, that's what we, what we should be taught. And I think maybe, like, those exceptions were taught how to independently think and find their purpose. Maybe, if, like you said, it doesn't have to be money. It could be a different purpose. And they did great in life. So I think, uh, yeah, I know for sure. That's a, <laughs> I think that that's a big... That's a big characteristic uh, that that people develop over time. The definite of purpose, like uh, like the sorry, I should say that's a, that's a that's a characteristic that children of wealthy people yeah uh, develop over time where they don't have yes the yeah. yeah but then again like who knows that maybe there's other things that they desire such as like you know maybe someone who's wealthy their child wants to go to the Olympics, for example. You know, we, we can't, I can't relate. Yeah, but like, yeah. We can't, like, generalize it. Yeah, but, sure. like, so let's say that he wants to go to the Olympics and maybe then he could have the right guidance and then he could understand the philosophy of success in that field. Achieving that, like, achieve going to the Olympics and winning, winning a gold medal, for example. Right. Because this isn't just about money, the stuff that we talk about. it. Yes, money does, you know, money is... Primary, the primary thing that we're always, you know, uh, chasing and trying to get. But uh, for a lot of people, there's other things in life too that they, they, they really, really want to attain. Like, you know, some some people just, you know, they have the money, but they want other things like a, a healthy relationship with their family that they haven't had or uh, like a good uh, hockey career, for example. You know, we yeah. don't know what people want. Yeah. But even those things are attainable through these same principles. Because 100%. Because they, they, you can, you know, you can listen to what Napoleon is saying and you can just rather than replace money with whatever that thing is that you want to get. So mm-hmm. if you want to go to the Olympics, then, you know, you have to visualize the Olympics. You have to imagine yourself uh, doing whatever you're going to be doing at the Olympics and winning and then believing in that, making it a burning desire and making it a major purpose and then staying on that path. Because once, so yes, money can be crippling. This is, this is another thing that to an extent we... Uh, I always think about this, that for, for the longest time, I always thought that like, oh, like, you know, like me not having the, the financially, family financial backing or not having, uh, you know, just, just crazy amounts of money laying around for me to access at any time is maybe it's a bad thing. That's what I've always thought, right? Not maybe, I was just yeah, known yeah. that it's just like, you know, I'm crippled with poverty or crippled with not, not poverty, but like crippled with not having everything that I want to have right now. Mm-hmm. But that's, it's a good thing because that, this is how you learn and this is how we'll, we're sitting yeah. here, we're talking about this, we're trying to figure it out, we're trying to build our own path. And the, path, think, yeah. the path is where all the teachings are and that those teachings are very important to live a fulfilled, healthy life. Yeah. I, think, I think, yeah, like, I think you're already starting to realize and eventually you'll see like that, that and if anything, you're not having those resources is a blessing. <laughs> yes, I think, I think I'm already starting to see it. I think I'm, yeah. see, I'm seeing it more than actually not at this point where it's like, okay, well, 
yes, obviously, you know, my uh, small mind, my lower self is always like, you know, only if I could win like a thirty million dollar yeah. lottery, and you know, things would be great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think that that that's the that's another thing Napoleon uh, touched on. It's also in other books that it's not it it this is something that needs constant work right like even i'm i'm sure like even napoleon himself was down some days right where his his lower self got hold of him but that like you need to have the awareness to know that you're starting to drift and you have to correct yourself yes that's that, that's, awesome. that's very important right yeah uh but drifting i think most importantly is in thought yeah. because a lot of 100%. times uh like cuz sometimes life just gives you something and you uh for example like if you you know like let's just take we, let's take working out for example like if you skip a gym day or two gym days but it, you you're still thinking about the person that you want to be which is fit and you're not forgetting who is trying to be then you're not drifting you're just in a place where you're you know you're not able to go to the gym today mm -hmm. like it's just you're drifting in a way but you're not drifting entirely where you're just thinking mm -hmm. oh is my mic okay yeah, yeah it's fine Okay, so you're not drifting in the sense of like, oh, like you're completely letting go of your purpose, your major purpose, or anything you're planning to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's the drifting where it's you completely let go. Say you have a thought, and usually this is this is what we see in kids, and this is how we used to be as kids too. Like when we would be playing uh, video games, mm -hmm. and we you know we got so like into the game, we don't. And there's the work that needs to be done. There's like other goals that we had. We would be like inspired to be like, okay, this year. I'm starting a new school year. I'm gonna have the best marks in class. I'm gonna have a number. I'm gonna be number one in my classes back in India. You know, a number, a number. <laughs> uh, so that's back then. That's what I used to think. But then, uh, like, that would be like day one, day two, day three, and then you would just let go and you you forget that what you were what were you trying to do. You start drifting because your purpose is gone from you. That's what kids do. But as you are growing up, as I'm growing up, obviously now we can't just do that because we have, we have to go to work every day. We have to do the work because if you don't do the work, that means that uh, like you won't be able to, you know, live a comfortable life. But that can also be a, of benefit to you because you have to go to work. That is just something that's already done. Now, how you're going to about it, you can change. You can either go about it in a way of drifting and dr like just drifting to work and just drifting at work. Or you could build a purpose, have a vision, look at it, be like, this is what I'm trying to attain and this is why I go to work. And then you go to work with that, you know, that enthusiasm. Right. So now when you're going to work, you're not drifting at work anymore. You're more focused because you know you have to be here. You might as well just put it towards your purpose rather yeah. than just waste this time which most people are doing and which I, guess, I have mostly done yeah i guess to to elaborate on that a little bit so what you're saying is even if your uh, uh definitive purpose is not what you do to work right now as long as you have the vision and the belief and you're visualizing that you, this is what you need to get yeah and and you you have like that's your purpose you should like you would start going to work with a with a happier mindset, even though you know this is just a path to get get you to and this or or either it's a path or it's gonna provide you resources which could be money to get you to your purpose, right? Yeah. So so hunches, right? Like so say that you whatever you want, you what what do you what do you like you know you you want a million dollars and that's a lot of money, but you're working a very average entry level job. As you obviously this takes years, but what happens is that you as soon as you tell yourself that and you are persistent in the faith that you will have that thing but you stay persistent in it your mind's gonna start giving you ideas and give yes. you a little bit of hunches like yeah, yeah. try this try that try yeah, to yeah. do this like for the the kind of person the money is just the generalization of because it's a quantifiable amount yeah. because you can say it's, a it's a generalization dollars. of success because oh, that's how people people measure it right I, I i don't think about it like that when i yeah. think about myself as like what i'm trying to be i think of like the kind of person that i want to be someone who isn't someone who isn't worried about money anymore someone who is focused on building a great life is what i think about i think about like someone like uh, when you think about myself i think about, like okay well in the future i want to be fit i want to not be worried about money anymore i want to have great relationships and yeah. great people around me so and i think I, I think i just want to add yeah, like i think a lot of people unless like unless you're like a business tycoon and, and money is a predominant thought i think uh, they, they they have a hard time articulating it, but i think i think that's a lot what a lot of people think they don't think about i need a hundred million dollars they think about I don't want to worry, worry about money. Yeah. Because I want freedom of time. 
Yeah. And I want a happy family and I, I want to be successful. I want to be proud of who I am. I want to be fit. I want to make sure the people that I care about are happy around me, right? <clears throat> and think, also be having a significant impact in the development of the world in general. That yeah. I also think about because obviously like I'm here, I want to live a happy, happy life, but I also want to have left some sort of an impact where I actually did make a difference in some sort of a way. So that is also important because if you just assume, oh, well, and then if it comes down to it and you want to put it like a, like amount of money on it, the amount of money could be whatever it is that you want, you, that you think will be what what you need to live the kind of life that you want to live. So you could put that amount and then be focused on that amount, whatever that would be for you. So for let's say like it's $100,000 per month or like it's, it's even $10,000 per month. You know, it's different for everyone. Whatever that is, like whatever you think is, this is the amount of money when if I have this kind of money, I will be perfectly okay with the way my life is going per month. Or like, uh, uh, of sum of money, let's say like $10 million. If I had this money, money, I'd be fine for the rest of my life. So whatever it is, but you have to set your vision on that and keep it on that. Yeah. And then obviously everything else, like the kind of person that you want to be, the kind of person, the the people that you want to have around you, the kind of body that you want to have, these are all like the, the pieces or the parts of life that you want to be developing into. But uh, in, in these books, it's mostly just about money because money is again, quantifiable and... Right. But this, again, applies to every aspect of life. You can't go back in life. You can't do it. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. But you can't do anything else that you want to do and attain anything else that you want to attain, be it in relationships, fitness, money, any, in any any kind of an area of your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure. Um, I guess we can talk about... Do you mind putting that uh, putting the notes back on? It's there? not up. Um, I was going to say, maybe we talk about how do you go about... Uh, building a uh, definitive purpose if uh, if you think that you're a drifter right now which which we know a lot of people are and i think it's a transient sp state like i was mentioning earlier like a lot of times you are in a good space and you start to drift but it's important to recognize that you're starting to drift and then correct yourself um so yeah we can maybe just talk about how to have a definitive purpose right and how like how do how do you identify what are you what are you passionate about and then how to keep that flame burning right I know one tool I per, I use, and I I think I think you probably started using it as well. Is, is visualization? Visualization is is is, uh, is is really powerful, and I think it it ties into that uh, law of uh, what uh, Napoleon calls it, uh, hypnotic rhythm or law of attraction, where um, you kind of act and and think about whatever your uh, purpose is as if it's or you have already achieved it. And the feelings that are associated with achieving that, right? For so, for example, if I take a small example, like you drive a Range Rover right now, right? So you want to get a, uh, I think yeah, I saw your wall, wallpaper there. You wanted you want to get a Range Rover Sport autobiography in the next, next couple of years, right? Yeah. If you can visualize yourself driving that car, feeling the steering wheel of the, well, wheel of the car, just imagining the feeling of sitting in that car, driving it around. I think that goes a long way, in and subconsciously embedded, embedding that uh, uh, purpose, or th that, that's as a part of, the, part, of the, part of the purpose, but the vision in your head. And also, like, that's what affirmations are about as well, right? A lot, a lot of these, like, this modern, they think you should, you should talk to yourself and just give yourself and repeat these affirmations to yourself. But all you're doing is just locking it into your subconscious. Yeah. And, and um, actually, a lot of athletes do this too, right? Obviously, like, pregame, they, they will sit down and they would, like, visualize the game on how they want, the game to go like a lot of ufc fighters do it obviously and then they like they go down to the t like conor mcgregor used to go down to the okay this is the chokehold i'm gonna put him in uh, this is these are the punches i'm gonna throw and this is how i'm gonna make him tap out so i think the visualization is a very strong tool it sounds if this is the first time someone's hearing about it it sounds very uh childish i don't know it's probably like not the right word for it at, on, on surface but the the power the visualization has for locking a vision into your subconscious and helping you keep that flame burning is is cannot be under uh, overstated at all okay you know what i mean and that's why like you know you I, I know you were trying to build a vision board as well at one point right yeah i think i think it's important to because like anytime like like you just need to like it's about repetition right yeah so like anytime you're feeling down like you'll just take a look over you, have, you see your vision board you, you, you your thought starts to get back aligned with what it needs to be yeah. and again everything ties back to the hypnotic rhythm your predominant thought is what you're going to attract 
I think visualization is just a tool, just a tool in that kit to help you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> does, that, does that make sense? You just look so perplexed right now. <laughs> no, no, it makes sense. I, I get what you're saying. But, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, what I understand about vis- visualization, I think it goes a lot deeper right. than just even imagining it, I would say. Because, okay, so whenever we say visualize, we usually mean that, oh, there's, let's, this car, for example, I want this car. I'm going to visualize having this car. Okay, well, okay, well, this, what if I'm like, okay, well, this sucks. I'm just going to close my eyes and just go, okay, well, I'm driving the car. Okay. Yes. Like, okay, well, yeah, okay, well, I'm done. So one now, what happened? Like, if you, if that's what you're thinking, obviously no, no. nothing's yeah. going to happen. But that's one thing. The other thing is that just uh, being so stubborn that what you want is going to be yours that there's just there's just no question about it that you just live your life you go about your life in a manner that whatever your purpose is whatever the thing that you're trying to attain is it's going to work and it's going to happen and you're going to have it that that's when you when you go about your life in in that sort of a way that's when the universe sort of starts to align things for you that's when things because it's i don't even know if it's the universe i could just be you yourself but, but we don't know that we don't know if it's our subconscious if it's the universe if it's if the ideas where they come from what what happens how but when you just go about life just knowing and having that faith in you it's the faith the faith in the attainment of the thing in the the faith is what's most most valuable mm-hmm. the visualization that's easy doing that once but to have faith in that visualization like having faith and assuming and believing that you're actually there i believe that i'm driving this car like like oh well uh i'm going to, i'm going to go well i'm driving past this expensive store you look at clothes that you want to buy let's just say for example you can't afford them you're looking at them and you're thinking, okay, well, I want to buy these clothes, but I can't afford them. You don't, you don't think that you can't afford them. What you think is, okay, well, three years from now, when I have all this, that your immediate thought, every time you see, see things that you can't afford now, should be, well, three years from now, when I, you know, this business takes over, this thing goes, then I'll, I'll get this, I'll get this, I'll get this. Like then you start like picking out things and you start seeing cars that are really expensive. You're like, okay, well, three years from now, when my business takes off, I'm gonna get this car. Yeah. yeah. Like, so I think no. So so I 100% agree. Uh, I think I think we're kind of saying the same thing where that faith, like I think that faith is a level up. Like that faith is what you need 100%. And you need to be, like you said, you need to be stubborn and you need to know it is yours to claim. Yes. Like even when you pray, you don't beg, you demand. Like that's yours to claim. But I, what I'm saying is visualization is just a tool to help you strengthen your faith. And when you visualize, like you can't go like, yeah, like it, it, if it feels like a chore, don't do it. You're not doing it right. And like, there's other other avenues of visualization, like a vision board, or like you, you just like I don't know, write yourself like a check in future for however many whatever the amount is, and you take a look at it once a day, or stick it to your ceiling, or what have you, right? Um, or what the visualization I'm talking about, if you're like sitting down visualizing, you should be, you should visualize as if you already already have attained it, yeah. and it should gives you give you goosebumps. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's how you know you're doing it right, and that's what helps you lock it in. But I think, yeah, overall, like you need a like faith is 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 definitely hundred percent what you need. I think uh, even uh, Napoleon said, I think you have it on one of my notes here. I'm trying to read. Oh yeah, so he's he's saying so being definitive in your plans, even if they're not necessarily strong plans. Therefore, one can't. Uh, sorry. Therefore, one can't always be right. One should always be definitive. So what he's trying to say there is, he asked the devil. Yeah. He's like. I have two people. Yeah. One with a strong plan, but not definitive in his plan. But his plan is like 10 times stronger than the other person. Yeah. And there's another person whose plan is pretty weak, but he's like so definitive in his plan. Like he just knows it's a reality, right? Which one is going to redeem itself? Like which one is actually going to happen? So he said, actually, if being definitive with your purpose is, is I, I don't want to say way, way important. It is the only thing that matters even if you have a weak, <laughs> weak, weak plan. So he's saying is, what he's saying is like, so having that knowledge, one should always operate from whatever uh, he, he plans to achieve that it, like you said, it's already mine. You know what I mean? You need, you need to have the faith that faith that's already yours. Don't uh, think about like make, making, like if you have a plan that's like 100% solid, but you don't fully believe in it versus having a plan that's, 
kind of loose, but you 100% know what's going to happen. Obviously, you should work on your plan, make sure it's 100% tight as well. But having that definitive belief is 10 times more important. You know what I mean? Having the definitive uh, purpose. Purpose, belief, faith, yeah. Having, yeah. So, I guess what you're saying, yeah. yeah. So, the plan could be weak, but the purpose could be has to be strong. Has to be strong. And okay. that, 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 that's what controls it or, or your belief. Yeah. Or like it, it has to be definitive. Right. So he said, he said, if you actually truly believe that, which Napoleon said, I do. So you, the way you would operate, you would always operate from a, a level of defin definitiveness. Like, so like all these great inventors and stuff, right. From back in the day, like uh, they had their, the people that were criticizing them were a hundred times more than the people that were supporting them, even 10,000 times more. Yeah. But they were definitive that they're going to get this right. Failure. 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 Yeah. Take a few deep breaths in. <laughs> okay, so we're going in deep stuff. <laughs> it's okay. It's so, it's, Rob, it's, it's actually a, an it's intervention only, here. Only, only <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's the first few podcasts. It's okay. We can... It's yeah. Fine. So, yeah, no, I think you were talking about uh, whose tool failure is. Yeah. Uh, how, who, does the, who does failure serve? Does it serve the devil or does it serve, serve the devil's opposition? Yeah, so that, that's what I was saying. Like, I think I think he kind of left that one open ended in the sense where for the non drifters, it's one of their tools. Did you notice how he calls it a uh, devil's opposition, but not God? How he was careful yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's I think I think that 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 was another thing that he was careful with. You know, like he's like, because he because at a few times he's like, well, because he asked the question, he's like, so why if you're if you have all these tools and tricks, why doesn't your opposition have it, right? Because yeah. he, he can't say why does why doesn't God have it? Are yeah. you better than God? You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. The, he just says my my opposition. My opposition, yeah. I think that he used the word God every now and then, but well, I think what he said, the devil says this. The devil says that like uh the people can even e either have a f uh faith in God or fear me. But people mostly fear me and not have faith in God. So right. like so people are scared of the devil. You know how like we're talking about living in fear, so people fear the devil, but people don't. Rather than having faith in God and living, see, it's 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 so simple if you think about it. So, say you're like you're a neutral person. You have you haven't had any experiences. You you know you're a blank slate. You just came to the world, and you're given two choices. You're like, okay, well here you go. Here's fear in the devil, or here's faith in God. Right. Which one would you choose? If you logically yeah. think about it. Faith in God. Faith in God. Because as soon as you choose fear, you're choosing to, you know, like say you you don't know anything about the future. Let's just assume that. You don't know anything. You don't know what's going to happen. You're on the street. If you choose to have faith in God, automatically you're a little bit happier. Right. Because you're like, I have faith. You know, I, like I'm good. I'm chilling. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have to be scared of it. Like, I'm happy, you know. Yeah. So, But like if you have uh, fear in the devil or if you fear the devil. Yeah. Then you're living life from a perspective. Okay, well, like, uh, like I'm living life, but like I don't know, like what's gonna hit me when? Oh no, this might happen or that might happen, and now that's happening, and that's uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. And I, I think I want to recommend, like, uh, I don't obviously it's the second podcast, but I just want to say, even uh, for like for the audience that's gonna listen to this, if you are. Like everyone needs to needs to listen to this audiobook at hundred percent. But if if you're between the ages of sixteen to twenty three to twenty four, yeah, make sure you take the time to listen to this audiobook. And the one thing I want to touch by, so when we we're talking about this earlier, is uh, like I quickly realized over the last year and a half, two years, that I would rather read a book very slowly and ponder upon it and contemplate what it's actually saying than reading six books in the same duration of time right yeah. and i think uh uh naval ravikant he's uh he's one of the he's a fairly smart guy on on twitter as well and he he tweeted about this quite a bit and he's a big uh, proponent of this is like when he reads books he will like read like three or four pages and he he's a, he doesn't have a page target like he, like you know how when you think about finishing a book in a week you're like well, i'm gonna read so many pages so i'm gonna finish in a week yeah then he's gonna he's gonna think about it and he might just read it like, if it's pretty intense and material might just read it the next morning and that's kind of what i did with this audiobook the second time i it's three and a half hours it took six or seven hours 
to listen to the uh, full audio but every time i was li- i was listening to anything interesting i was like okay i paused and i i thought about what the real life implication of this is and what they what it's actually saying to comprehend it right so i think that's that that's another takeaway for our younger audience like if you're listening to this book don't worry it could like even if it takes you like six days to get through it if you're listening 10 minutes at a time and then you're re-listening to it there's a lot packed into it um and, and i think uh like again like there's if, if if you read like six great books over and over for the rest of your life versus reading 600 books i think the first the uh the the, the, the first option is a lot better than the latter for sure i think um yeah, just 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 wanted just wanted to add that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> See, with the personal development books and stuff, I uh, I think uh, I everyone sort of finds their own own way of doing things, right? Because uh, it's more what's most important is actually doing it. Whether it be you read one book ten times or you read ten different books in a day, I think what's most important is just picking up any book. And anything that you know has helped people has, uh, like Napoleon, for example, anyone can pick up Napoleon Hill and get, get something from it. So it's most important to just pick it up and start reading yep. anything. And if things make sense, good. If they don't make sense, then just keep trying and keep going through it again and again and try other things by the same author or like some other authors even that you know have helped other people. And then just if you stay down that path and... I think eventually one day it sort of just clicks to you. And uh, another thing I want to talk about here, like, you know how like we talk about faith? Yeah. Let's let's take out like, like Sikh religion, for example. Um, see, my mom, she's always tried to like uh, get me to like have faith in Wahiguru, you know, like mm-hmm. have faith, uh, like do part and stuff, like stuff like that. But obviously, like, you know, like I, I'm always, you know, like what... I'm always just trying to brush it off like because I don't feel that faith. But a lot of these books and a lot of even the, the religious literature, a lot of those things that they talk about, it's very similar. 100%. Uh, philosophy, the philosophy of success, for example, that Napoleon Hill has written, it's it's just another case for the same content. But this he is... Does, he does mention that in his uh, in his um, book as well. He's like, he's like, well, what if the teachings of the christ because he's obviously he's i don't know if he's catholic but he's definitely christian and he was like and the devil's like yeah the teachings of the christ are absolutely right if people actually try to understand what he's saying rather than getting hung up on the events and and uh, you know like like the various traditions and and what have you because i think like it it gets lost in translation right like a lot of it gets (laughs) gets lost in translation and like you said there's a lot of similarities between these different religions napoleon hill also says even a lot of like the great uh, philosophers yeah. talk about talk about similar stuff and that's why i guess that's why i was saying like even for for, for younger audience like yeah like it could they could they could read like 10 books in 10 days at in, in that sense they would it would click from a sense of repetition uh but like from what we have seen and the books we have read i would say it would be fair to recommend uh that starting with like a napoleon hick hill think and grow rich or a outwitting the devil versus the newer books that they see out in the market right now is going to build a lot solider foundation for them to start this, right? Would you agree with that? Uh, this is, see, I could, I could give you my example. Right. And I could tell you that when I first read Think I Go Rich, now that I listen to it or I read it, I can clearly see that any new book, it comes from, that's fine, it's okay, calm down. Should, should I let them know? Breathe in. Breathe in. No, but I think I don't know if it's gonna pick up on. It's the... fine. Don't worry. About it. It's fine. Quick. Um, so I was saying. So when I when I first read Think and Go Rich, right? I I I didn't get it. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Sorry, I just realized. It's like you're like breathe, breathe. People are gonna think Abby's got rage issues or something. He's gonna fucking flip the equipment here. Fuck this shit. I'm out of here. It's like Abby, breathe, breathe, breathe. It's okay. Kuchmira. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sorry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe. <laughs> meditate, guys. Meditate. Meditate. Breathe in, breathe out. But are sorry. They, are they playing? Are they playing music? No, I just, just a little bit of chatter. Fuck it, noise. That's fine. It's fine. Uh, where was I? Yeah. So when I first read Think or listened to Thinking Rich, it didn't make sense to me, and it, it sounded like it was very long. Any sort of self self help literature or like any of these books that we're going to talk about here it's 
it's it's very difficult to explain this stuff and talk about it because it the newer literature it's it's not it's not very there's not a lot of content in it it's a lot of uh, surface levels uh tactical stuff mm. the real the, the the idea of faith or like whatever napoleon hill talks about it's these ideas they're more of building an understanding rather than getting the knowledge of them because a knowledge i guess they're fundamentals right you could call them rather yeah. than like strategy yeah the 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 modern ones are more strategy but that's what i'm saying like if if you start with these books and have the fundamentals and understand them even though you spend more lot more time on them yeah once you read these like these modern books that are like like say a specific stock trading strategy yeah right and like obviously technical stuff you're not going to relate to but the mindset yeah. well, you you're going to think but oh okay i see i see what he what it means now uh, right? yeah i guess right i guess but i guess well in in the in the case of a stock, stock trading tra- strategy i guess there would be like patience yeah i guess maybe that's different what about leadership let's say leadership Leader, yes leadership with, but but then in this book napoleon hill had a like a chapter dedicated to like the kind of person that you need to be to be a <clears throat> effective leader hmm. which is i think i think that was great because when i first read this book the only part that made sense to me was qualities of a good leader and that's it everything else they just went over top of my head because i didn't have faith in it yet right so i think that like i was saying earlier the philosophies of like even re- religious teachings or the philosophies that we see in these books like by napoleon hill right they're very similar but napoleon hill he encased it in a way of like attainment in right. like a lot of and i've seen or heard other podcasters talk about how uh self help books or not self help like napoleon hills books they're they're a lot like the bible a lot of the the success mm. principles are coming that's a good way to put it yeah i know what you mean they're yeah. coming from the bible they they they're pretty similar and i was saying earlier my mom she tried to get me on you know doing like the guru granth sahib like trying to get me on the ideas that to you know do the part every day so doing part or like so obviously like we do part every day because it's supposed to like you know keep it keep the ideas fresh in our mind right but the as you start reading and you start looking at it you're like you literally read the translation then you start realizing these the ideas that they're trying to put through they're so similar all of them and the faith thing that I was talking about once you have faith in whatever it could be it could be this this book by napoleon hill or it could be the book out reading the devil or it could be uh any any religion that anyone follows but if you start living from a place of faith right as he says in the book too like he said mm-hmm. like having faith in god or fearing the devil mm-hmm. once you start living from a place of faith uh then you start just knowing that things are going to be okay and that's when quantum physics and like the subconscious and everything like takes connect- so, takes place yeah yeah because once you have the faith and you know you're fine then things are going to be fine because that's what you decided and reality is created with our thoughts we all know all that stuff right mm-hmm. so the hardest part to understand or the hardest part to have click and matter with all these things because there's different levels to this stuff right now like now Ravi Khan talking about books is that he could be trying to um like he could be talking about a principle that really impacted him like one principle and he now wants to integrate Sorry, who are you talking about? Now oh, yeah, right, right, yeah. Now yeah. Yeah. He said he you know how he said that he reads one book multiple times in a day. Mm-hmm. That could be because he's just trying to have that one idea embedded in his mind like completely. Like because he i'm sure already has the faith right so he's not he's saying that he's just trying to embed but to first get to the position of where like you start having the faith and the best way to have faith is to have faith that's based on knowledge he talks about it in this book as well so faith having blind faith is what sometimes could be stupidity but having faith with knowledge backing it understanding yes it. yeah blind faith will lead to like you being delusional 100% and i guess the, just to touch on like the point from naval so yeah no I, i i agree and i think the other angle he could be taking at it is like he's read so many books and he's he's noticed that 
like you know how we're talking about similarities and patterns even through religions he figures better understand the few key yeah. books right rather because yeah. you're gonna find the same stuff the other thing also where what might be informing his decision is he he read a few pretty intense uh scient- scientific uh, like books like from there's a, there's a phys- this physicist his name's a David David Doish or something I think I'm probably butchering the pronunciation there, but he wrote a book. It's called the the beginning of infinity, mm-hmm. and he talks about like multiverse, and how mul- like and kind of just explains you through context on how multiverse actually exists. Yeah, and and proves it. And like he 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 reads those sorts of book which are pretty dense. Yeah, like they're it's so dense that you actually read a page and he, he David's explaining you this example of like how multiverse exists and how you can like this coupling and all that stuff and he's like oh wow i gotta take a step back so maybe maybe also he's talking about probably like that's probably informing his decision here, here as well because he does read a lot of those heavy intense context heavy books right yeah so there's obviously there's there's general knowledge books and there's things that we're talking about what we're talking about is most of more of personal development and bringing yeah. yourself into the right headspace to be able to function properly and then create the life that you're trying to create right so that's different from uh so things books like uh napoleon hills think and grow rich or even this one outreading the devil these books they're they're designed more to get us to be in the right headspace and start thinking positively so then we can go out and create our lives that the way that yep. need to be created uh because obviously then the universe has you know whatever i don't like a lot of people they don't we don't know how it works but it does work which yeah. in whatever yeah, way, no one knows at, at this point like we were saying earlier like they don't know scientifically how it works we, but there's enough proof that it, it works that it works <laughs> yes that's it that they get it works that if you think straight you'll get straight that's yeah, all it is 100 so what i was saying is that um these books that we were trying to listen to we're trying to talk about these are no, i think novels like maybe by him saying that because he wants you to have faith in one idea right and he wants you to stop drifting around so much that's why he's telling you to just read one book and stick to it because once you because maybe 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 we need to bring him up on the podcast and that's <laughs> no i don't and know here. he's not up to the over level yet he's not he's not <laughs> we should, we should, you should edit that out no no, no i'm just kidding it's, obviously it's a joke <laughs> Uh, no, I think I think he's, he's a very humble human being. If he if anything, he's gonna laugh about it. Yeah, like, can yeah. you imagine if if he does come on this podcast? I'm gonna show him this tape from episode two. Yeah, <laughs> because, well, we're gonna do like hundreds of episodes, so eventually we don't know. We yeah. never know where what's gonna go. Where it's gonna happen? Yeah. yeah. Uh, w- w- Is there anything else? We I'm just looking at the notes here that I missed. Oh, we have so we can talk about quickly. Oh, there's this section. I don't know how much. Hold on. Why are you Why are you getting anxious? What's that? Why are you leaving already? What do you mean? You're, you're trying to end the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no. You're like, oh, well, I'm just going to quickly look at the things that we have left and... Uh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just... Uh, no, I'm just... I think uh, we'll... F- no, because I'm just thinking about <clears throat> the agenda and trying to see uh, if we have actually covered everything with the book. But yeah, we can we can just go off the cuff. doesn't matter. Controlled. I know you like were you were you did you were you gonna go on a separate train of thought there? No, no, no. I was thinking about something. Okay. See this is this is gonna be a little bit of a difficult one. Okay, interesting. <laughs> Let's see. Controlled sex emotions. Le- that's literally what I was trying to say. Oh I, I, yeah, I was I was I was saying, okay, it looks like we covered everything. And I, what I was gonna ask you was there's this controlled sex emotion yeah. that, that he discussed. So I don't know I was gonna see what your take on it is. Yeah. And and how you understood it yeah because it's been it's been it, you can find that in um, a lot of modern literature as well right if you if you abuse sex um mm-hmm. how it affects you in you know, other walks of life it just affects your ambition and like takes the fuck sucks the life force out of you yeah. for like a lack of better words if you abuse it yeah. if you use it correctly it feeds you so i just wanted to see what first off yeah see if you were comfortable talking about it no i'm very comfortable because i know you're you're smashing left right and center all day long <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay well so so that's why maybe you know what that that, that maybe that that's why you no, thought no 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 maybe so that's why you thought you, we were a little tight today because you you've been you've been smashing too much lately. no 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 okay so you're gonna you're gonna you're about to uh learn a lot of things just right now okay Are you ready okay, hold up hold up let me let me get settled here okay <laughs> okay this is gonna get intense all right. So, sex emotion is not what you keep referring to. That is a physical expression of sexual emotion. 
It's two different things. All right. Like, you know, when, so when we use the term sex, it's become, because we live in a society like, you know, where we usually think surface level. So sex emotion is just, sexual energy is nothing more than the physical expression of the sexual, sexual energy, whether it be like, you know, uh, expressing it by yourself or with a partner. <clears throat> mm-hmm. yeah. So that's not what Napoleon Hill refers to as sex emotion. Sex emotion is a lot deeper than that. It's uh, Yeah, I think 100%. So just to add to that before you dive in, like he he talks about, like obviously that that's part of it on surface, but he talks about how how it controls the other aspects of your life and how it is, how that energy, that sexual energy is, is way deeper, which, yeah. which you're going to dive into here, yeah. Yeah, because, well, the, so another, first of all, so one thing he said that I, you know, that I truly believe is that highly sexed people always, they tend to make great leaders. Right. And highly sexed Agreed. people are, are very creative because sexual energy, when you have high amounts of sexual energy, which is one of the most, uh, uh, the most impactful things that we have in our body, like sexual energy. When you have high amounts of sexual energy, that means you're going to be creative. You're going to have a pleasing personality. You're going to be more like, uh, it, you because you you have more enthusiasm towards life as is. That's that's how I would say it. That's why it helps you become a better leader or just a better person in general in a lot of areas of life, and. People that don't have that much or that high of a sexual drive, you'll not people. Let's just let's just use animals for example. As soon as like uh, dogs get neutered, they stop being as wild or vicious. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Actually, that, that that that's the reason they they neuter the dogs, right? Because they're trying to act uh, act up and like be very aggressive and stuff, right? Yeah. So, but that aggression and that acting up that is important. It is important to be controlling it as well, though. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. So we human beings, we don't get neutered, obviously. We <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> yeah, hopefully but not. we. Th- so we do. Uh, we, we're carrying this this energy around with us, but the way we're using it is just expanding it through physical expression or thinking of thinking, spending it in creative ways, but for the destructive, not for the constructive. So when you're spending time, wasting time, thinking about like, you know, destructive tasks, anything that is like, it could be, you know, uh, uh, imagining not the best stuff, you know, like if, if you're just imagining the worst all the time, like if you look at like, let's, let's take girls, for example, like we, we can like, uh, like when we go to the gym, for example, we see, we encounter male and female people there we encounter all kinds of no let me finish let me finish don't laugh at me no, just, no, just, just, the, just the way you said male and female it's like, yeah, it's, like it's like we're going to the jungle we have male tigers and female tigers yeah, yeah but we our tendency is to just like not our tendency is but come on like we we hear what kind of talk is had around about like girls and like the like you know how like our very like basic instinction with girls is to just see them as like the sexual creatures you know i mean i guess i guess depends on how how mature uh you are but instinctively instinctively as you said that how mature you are mature in what that like uh, i guess mature in first off uh how i guess how much control you have on your sexual energy right because like like technically sexual energy and napoleon talks about it can be channeled into creative things, into yeah. into your confidence, into your charisma, into ambition, into your passion, right? So, um, I think it's like obviously instinctively, like when you, because that that's how like humans like through evolution came up. Like uh, when you when you see see a woman and, and she's got a nice body and, and you know you're attractive to her, yeah. Um, like you do have those feelings, but like I think I think it's about it's it's again it's about the sexual maturity which which I just explained like it it, it it's 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 a um it's a spectrum, and like if you're just young and immature and and you're wasting your sexual energy, your 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 mind's in the gutter, right? Yeah. But if if you if you have uh, if you know how to channelize your sexual en- energy properly, you know you could actually like if you have a lot of sexual energy and you have a high sex drive, uh, and you're not misusing it. You know, by like just self pleasure every time, or pleasure, just 
messing around with your partner, what have you, right? Dude, if you're not misusing it, you know how you can channel it properly. And if you do meet 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 a meet a person like that, you can have a, you know it's it, it's it's a different it's a different mindset you approach it with. I I just want to clarify that because I know. Um, like when you were like talking about the gym, and I, I don't know what angle you were going going uh, from there. There's a spectrum, and that spectrum goes from immature and misused sexual energy to matured and channeled sexual energy. Yes, and that spectrum is something that you I th- I think that you constantly have to work on, mm-hmm. and because you you can never be I guess you can attain a point in life where you are now very mature and you understand that just you abusing all of it just in that one place is not ideal and there's other ways of putting channeling it and uh in one of the books he's talking about how men seldom achieve any sort of like success in life before they reach like 40 because it takes a certain amount of life experience to understand that there's no point putting all your sexual energy just in one direction which is destructive and then over time you start be- maturing you start realizing that I've been abusing my sexual energy in this one avenue where it could have been applied to all these other avenues, mm-hmm. which we, this isn't something that sounds like a button you can click on and off. This takes discipline. This this takes uh, an understanding and a maturity to a maturity level. Maturity level, for sure. Yeah, and you also have to have to have had enough life experiences to understand this, to like, mm-hmm. so if someone who's... Uh, never been with a woman a guy who's never been with a woman how is that person going to understand that like putting all your energy there all the time isn't going to serve you the best because like a teenager who's like you know like uh, his hormones are all over the place they don't understand that like this energy something needs to be controlled because it's just so wild Mm -hmm. so it just it's you're just trying to take it into one direction and then you've never been with a partner so you're just always imagining that you're always throwing it away with the imagination of a a potential partner in the future so that's why you're you're always doing that mm-hmm. now you're 20 25 30 like if you never if you never spend time with a partner you never realize that having been wasting thinking about this wasn't was serving you if you had been utilizing it for the development of yourself and then you would have been able to uh attract more partners because you would not able to you know be, be more charismatic be more confident actually be able to talk up to them and then like not even like and, and not even just in like the, the the sexual and attracting partner uh aspect like in life you would have been a lot more successful because you can channelize that 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 energy you 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 would have been a lot more focused that that, that that's actually right up out, out of a study um uh, but i think like you said like when you were when you're teenagers freshly like you start realizing having all these feelings your hormones all over the place that that's fine it's kind of understood that you're gonna you're gonna like figure out what's going on you can explore but i think at, at a certain age uh it, it, it would be ideal if you realize okay i need to channelize this energy but if you never do and like you go let's say you turn 35 and you're like still doing the same same stuff and you're just using the sexual energy for destructive purposes and just wasting it away that's what's like it's understood at a teenage years because you just you just realize what this is but i think along the way you get a mature and understand that you gotta that you need to be smart with it and like total total abstinence is not a solution either i've seen and i'm the reason i bring it up i've seen this was like a thing going on uh i don't know if it was like a like no fab no stuff? no fab movement yeah, yeah. yeah it was like a, it was like it's not, like it's not it wasn't something that was going on it's something that goes on it's like a it's like a thing like maybe, there's a lot of people that maybe follow. like I'm, I'm old school and stuff i don't have instagram and facebook i just i just uh heard about it last year for oh. the fir- for the first time how, mm-hmm. how how long before was it going it's been going for years i don't even know myself oh, really yeah it's so it's I- like a old lo- old old thing people try to like do no fab because they, but they, the, the which is odd because if you're trying to use your sexual energy for the development of yourself as a person but then at the same time you never l- let that energy release then so so question for you just because i i just heard about it last year so is no fab does that mean like no self release or even with your partner nothing like so even if you're dating someone like nothing no you're not supposed to just nothing. and how long are you supposed to do that for it depends on like how long you're going for sometimes like a month sometimes it's like a year some people do it for four years like that's the wow so like so that's when I, so when i first read about it last year so yeah okay it's, it's interesting to know it's been going for a few years i realized that that is destructive too man oh like can you imagine if, if you have a girlfriend and you're like i'm gonna be going on no fap i think i think se- sexual uh energy needs to be i think again it's, it's all about maturity and experience that you have and eventually you realize when you're actually like 
overusing it and and, and killing yourself and the other aspects of life and, and I guess abusing it. But also, you can't go total abstinence where you like out again, no fap or no like no sexual sexual activity for three four months. That's like that's gonna drive, in my opinion. Like I, I obviously I don't know, I haven't seen the results. That's gonna drive you nuts. And it's just like I, I think I think there's a balancing act, right? Which and people are gonna be like, okay, so how do you find the balance? What's the sweet balance? I think that is very subjective. Subjective, and it's based on the individual. Some people have like super low libido. Mm-hmm. Some people have high libido, right? Um, I I have a fairly high libido as well. So for me, it'll be impossible to do that. But I think you need to be smart with it. You need to, and I think that's that's on an individual level. You need to realize and know yourself, and like be be in tune with yourself. It's like, am I always feeling great and am I, am I actually channelizing sexual energy properly right like because if you I, for me i feel like if you'd go no five or four months i'll be so like i'll just be so aggressive and full of rage all the time like you know what i mean or you'll just be thinking about that one thing all the, all time. the time yeah you'll which, be in that loop which is there's no point because then you're back to you're doing exactly what you were doing trying to not do Right. By doing the thing because it doesn't make any sense. But this is very different. This is, I think it's, uh, from what I understand, I think it's understanding your sexu- like sexuality and understanding that you do have sexual energy and not abusing it all the time right. and not just using it for destructive causes. And that's, this, is, this is something that obviously, like if, if you're married and stuff, you, like, like your partner and like everyone should understand. You should understand that like, you know, like, and obviously... I think it it would just become destructive to the relationship too if you're just yeah, yeah, abusing it all the time because then there's something that you're trying to get out of it through physical expression that it's not going to give you. Like, yeah. it's like The only way sexual energy is going to give you anything is through the the, the right avenues by transmuting this, these sexual by by controlling the sexual energy and just putting it towards some, some actually productive areas in life. And the, the, uh, not by completely abstaining from physical expression, but by being selective with how much energy you're going to use where. And that is, it could be done very naturally too. Like, very nat- I yeah. think to me, I don't know, but I think to me it comes very nice. Like, I don't even need to think, think about the stuff. I think Same. It just, Same. I, I think it comes right. Like, you know, you know when you're abusing it. You like for me, and I think I think maybe on an individual level, like I said, the frequency and everything depends on who you are as a person is subjective. Yeah. But, you do know, like, I, I, this is not something you, that you need years of experience. And like, you just, I, I inherently know I'm, if I'm like tipping the scale to abusing it or if I'm like properly channelizing and balancing it out. Yeah. Because, yeah. Physical expression is also important. You can't just, yeah. you know, forever. Cause, but then, then again, in moderation, in yeah. every aspect of it. Okay. What's the next one? What we got next? I think, uh, honestly, I think that is for the most part, cause we looked at like the seven principles. We've been talking about that as we go throughout the book right and obviously the uh, definitiveness of purpose was one of the big ones that that we started with yeah uh, mastery over self learning from adversity so yeah we talked about failure controlling environmental influence so this is this is an important one and just i guess quickly touch base on this like this is what you know like oh. you have, you've heard that cliche is like don't uh uh you can figure out who a person is and their personality and their goals by their five closest associates, friends, slash family members, right? Yes. Like who are the five closest people to them is? So we'll, we'll stay on this one for a minute here. Controlling okay. environmental influence. Because this is, the, I think this is very important. And this, so I think that, like the five closest friends, I think that applied and does apply. But a lot of people, they, uh, even with the people that they're uh, amongst, they, no. st- they won't, uh, they'll keep their individuality alive through other means, such as uh, books. Like I was saying, like because when we're listening to a book or when we're reading a book, we're basically associating with the author at the point because we're ha- we're having a conversation with the author. Uh, when we're listening to a podcast, when who is who are listening to this, they can basically look at us as the people, as one of the people that. You can relate with. Yeah, is in their close friends group. Like that's why I think the internet now is it's been very helpful because with the internet, it's, it's given us the ability to look at and see how a lot of these a lot of these people think. Right. Be it through uh, books or. Okay, let's take a quick break. Yeah, 
Controlling uh, our environment. Yeah, controlling our yeah, controlling our environments could be anything. And I was saying that I'm grateful for the internet for us to have like access to uh, people basically now that we can basically watch through podcast and other things that you know we can basically sit in the room with them and we're listening to their conversation that's associating with co- people closely right and I, we can I, choose I, to look at that rather than being influenced by our immediate environment that is true that is which, true which is probably not going to serve us for the best because if we associate with the media environment we're going to get what they're getting which is not a lot right yeah and i think i think and, and that that's that's a hybrid to what napoleon proposed napoleon was saying essentially <laughs> like reevaluate your immediate environment mm-hmm. and and kick out people that don't uh you know like that are not in tune with with your definitive purpose or like are trying to put you down and stuff i think a hybrid solution to that is like what you're saying is is like you you can selectively choose to associate with people that you can feed feed from right and then like that would that would uplift you you like and and it, it's fairly easy fairly easy to recognize what those are or who who those people are and i think like a lot of introverts now actually do like like you were saying the podcast and everything they 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 do relate to a lot of um people on the internet like whether those be podcasters or influencers and stuff like that yeah so i think yeah i think i think that's a hybrid solution to what napoleon was proposing back then like where you don't have to actually reevaluate and <laughs> dismantle your clo- closest friend group and like you know like s- start fresh you just you could just be selective you're mm-hmm. selective with conversations and selective with the uh, what particular things you associate with with certain people right you can just stop engaging in things that don't serve you basically. exactly you yeah. don't have to engage in things that you know you could just simply be there but not be there psychologically you could just be sitting there but not not yeah. in, indulging in the same thought that other people are trying to indulge in because a lot of times yeah cuz destructive thoughts they do uh because well when someone's talking to you about something you tend to like have try to have that the same thought you know like like even like you know like locker room talk basically let's talk about that like lo- like if, if there's like you know little boys having these fun destructive conversations that are not going to serve them for the for any better but they're just uh saying things that are like e- either coming out coming at each other's expense or building beliefs in each other that are going to be holding them that back in the future things like you know th- things that little things that we throw out that have a big influence but we don't think about them because l- these little things they do have an influence in the on, in our mind but that ha- it it embeds over time because yeah. they people just look at you a certain way and they, then you start looking at yourself that way too because you keep putting yourself in that environment yeah. and but when there's people that are uh telling you and assume, you know they because it, like like i've said people like human potential is limitless and for anyone to tell you otherwise is that means that you're building a limiting belief right that means that you're stopping yourself from attaining all that you can because we can all attain anything in the world but as soon as like you but you if i put this idea in a room of people that don't uh, 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 vibrate at the same level they're going to be like oh well like you know they're going they're going to say things that are going to start bringing me down tearing me down tearing this vision down that i had and putting holes in it and now i could choose to either look at the holes or just acknowledge that these po- people have pointed out holes but i'm going to choose to look around the hole and look at the donut not the hole yeah no that that's a good point and i guess just to add to that what you were saying earlier like you can just choose not to engage i think one uh you need you need to put a hard stop when it comes to comes to gossip though like i think and that that kind of relates back to the previous podcast that we had about being uh, by the four agreements and being impeccable with the word where you need to um like any any time your closest circle starts gossiping you need to disassociate either leave or just let them know it's like let's just let's just not do that like i think go- gossiping is is a sign of weak minds and the talking talking behind people's back is 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 the last thing you want to do as like if you, like that that's like this that's like the first fundamental you want to set if you want to actually even start on the road of personal development right that, that's so, when you know that you're not on the level the, the the path to greatness when you're talking about someone else. exactly but i think i think like for most part you can disengage but when it comes to like gossip you need to either stop that or you can need to like walk up uh well yes i guess or you just just abstain from saying anything No but like for me personally that's what I would disagree like I w- don't even want to be in the room don't even want to listen to the conversation No but this is in the case that there's no option but to Yeah okay have yeah, to yeah. be there because yeah, yeah. you don't have any better option And we yeah that and then there's all these other things that come up like the 
idea of the lone wolf. You know, like I don't know if you've seen those. Yeah. Like you say, like, oh, I'm the I'm a lone wolf because I go my own way because people don't understand me. And then, yes, but uh, like maybe in your like be, people do understand you to some extent, but not entirely. In that case, you have to be understanding of people to the level that they do understand you. Because I'm I'm sure that not all ten of the people that are around you are all bad. Maybe like one out of them has something 100%. to give you at least. And I think, I think it's, a, again, it's a spectrum. Like people have good traits, people have bad traits, right? Yeah. So it's, you, it's just not like, it's not like this person's bad. He's amazing in these things and she's amazing in these things, but she has some drawbacks and everything. And that that's where you like choose to selectively engage, right? Um, but yeah, for sure. I think, uh, what do you think about uh, wrapping this one up here and then we'll start, uh, well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll continue this one for the, for the last few items that we may have missed or yeah no no we'll just wrap it up i think we'll we, we talked about everything let me see i think, I think so too uh i think th i think that this one was a lot better than the last one um it just was it? i think the last one was better i, I think it was only and I, I think when we watch this video we'll, we'll realize this was actually pretty good i think our thoughts were a lot more concise Mm -hmm. and we weren't going around in circles the last time maybe like we were we, like if you listen to the last little bit of our last podcast like i think we repeated ourselves no that was because we were getting tired but today i think we uh we were very hit and miss with a lot of ide ideas mm -hmm. like a lot of things aren't very clear in our own minds i think might mm -hmm. be i don't know yeah okay no maybe and but honestly i think this is good like this is good to have good, good to have these days because if we're going to be doing this like we're going to make two podcasts a week or at least or one podcast a week. We're going to have those days where it just, we're not on our A game, but I think it's the, what, what matters is we, we, we went, spent we went time. through it. We spent through it and we actually spent twice as much time as we did on the first podcast. So and that's true. And, and trust me, I think you'll be surprised when we look at it and we edit it and we actually listen to ourselves. I think it's a lot more concise for sure. Okay, well, that sounds great. Anything else? Anything else you want to add? I think, uh, last thoughts. Yeah, please don't engage in the no fap movement. That's my personal opinion. No, <laughs> Do your own up, research. That's up to you. <laughs> uh, Do your own research. That's up to you. I don't know. Like, people, if they if it's benefited people, that's good. Good for them. I can't understand it. Neither. I, I, I don't understand it. I'm either. not going to try to understand it either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have the capability to understand. I don't, personally. You, I, are you trying to say I don't have the discipline? I'm just saying. Uh, you're gonna have some other issues if you try to do that. Okay, I c it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. I'm not going to try to do that. That's yeah. stupid. Let's not. Let's not try to do that. Yeah, let's not try to do that. All right. Thanks, guys. I think we'll wrap it up with that. Avi Singh and uh, Prabhdeep Singh signing out here. And thanks for tuning in.